good afternoon everybody it is indeed a privilege for us to have a highly distinguished scientist and an author a celebrated author professor bruce alberts to be with us today in fact we should uh, at the beginning we should thank professor d balasubramanian who has facilitated this visit of professor bruce alberts to university of hyderabad campus let us all extend a warm welcome to professor bruce alberts for this distinguished lecture he is here in hyderabad to participate in lv prasad i institute's foundation day celebrations but on this occasion professor balasubramanian helped us to have bruce alberts with us and he was kind enough to accept our request and to be with us and i am really happy to see that all the students have really understood what the speaker is what the today's distinguished speaker is and this auditorium is jam packed for this wonderful lecture from bruce we all look forward to a wonderful lecture and university of hyderabad has a tradition is uh, uh, to have every month one distinguished lecture when somebody an outstanding scholar visits the university and it is under this distinguished under this series of distinguished lectures we have requested professor bruce alberts to deliver the lecture and the title is in front of you i don't want to talk but i i do want you all of you to know what professor bruce alberts has been and for for us to give more details of uh, professor bruce i request mrunal bhattacharya professor professor mrunal bhattacharya head department of biochemistry to introduce the speaker to the audience professor mrunal Professor Albert does not need any introduction to this audience. Um, each one of us who are present in this auditorium has read his book, Molecular Biology <laughs> of the Cell. On uh, behalf of the entire teaching fraternity as well as the student, let me register my gratitude towards him for his heroic effort in writing that book. and teaching us how to study molecular biology in the context of the cell and how to study cell biology in the context of the cell to cell communication although professor albert does not need any introduction however since the protocol demands it i will be very brief professor albert obtained his phd from harvard university while working on biophysical aspects of dna replication then during his postdoctoral work at university of geneva he worked on the reconstitution of replication machineries of t4 bacteriophage where he has discovered gene 32 of t4 bacteriophage soon after that he joined princeton university as an assistant professor and within 8 years he became full professor at princeton university later on he moved to university of california san francisco he has contributed immensely in the field of dna replication and recombination his group has shown that during replication the leading strand polymerase and the lagging strand polymerase are coupled he has received many awards from us as well as global uh, worldwide 
and uh, few of them are NAS award in molecular biology, commander of the order of the British Empire, Vannevar Bush award and national medal of science. He has served as the editor in chief of science and also served as the president of the National Academy of Sciences USA for two terms. He is an um, science educator and today we will uh, elaborate on um, the problems and um, strategies of biomedical sciences and teach us how to keep science healthy. May I uh, now request Professor Alberts to deliver his lecture. Unfortunately, all these people are standing. I'm not sure it's worth standing. Uh, do they, can people come up front and sit? I don't know what was possible. The vice chancellor could tell us what. <laughs> but anyway, it's very crowded back there. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, I have many friends in India. This is I made many trips to India. And I've learned a lot from India. Um, I'm going, at the end of my trip, uh, I'm here for over two weeks. I'm going to visit for about the sixth or seventh time with M. S. Swaminathan at his institute in Chennai, uh, where when I was president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, I, I learned how science could really be used much more broadly to help people in society. It's still a very important issue, and most of our universities uh, I don't think we do enough to educate our students about the opportunities to use science in more than the standard ways where I'm going to talk about, <laughs> that are talked about in my textbook, in, in ways that could really reach out, as Swamindathan does, to uh, empower women in India's hundreds of thousands of rural villages. So uh, I have a much broader view of science, uh, thanks to India, uh, than I had before I came to India. But the main topic of my lecture today is about the kind of science that's described in our textbook and uh, all the opportunities for young people, uh, the many challenges, many unknowns, the great excitement, really, that for young people to be able to peel back some of the central mysteries of life that still remain. Okay, so I'm going to start with a little personal history. I spent nearly 40 years already <laughs> writing textbooks. I'm still working on yet, I think it's our 11th book, but anyway, and I'm looking for a young person to replace me, so any volunteers? <laughs> Uh, how did I get started watch, writing a textbook? This is a famous picture taken when I was in high school of Jim Watson and his in 1953 uh, with their famous double helix model. Uh, when I got the phone call in 1978 from Jim Watson, he was now 50 years old, not 25 anymore. And he had this great idea that there were two fields that were not interacting and not connected well in 1978. One was called molecular biology. It came out of chemistry, and it was the field in which I had worked and Watson had worked. And uh, basically, we were trying to figure out the molecular mechanisms that made cells possible. How is life possible from a chemical standpoint? Uh, there was another field, which I really had only vaguely heard of, called cell biology. And cell biology came from a completely different tradition of light microscopy, beautiful light microscopy done in the 19th century. Uh, 
Uh, th th there's a wonderful uh, textbook by E.B. Wilson uh, on cell biology written uh, in 1925, the third edition, which describes all the wonderful things that had been discovered by simple light microscopy looking carefully at cells. Nobody since has ever looked this carefully at cells. That's all they could do. They had no other technology. And then that continued, but then was added onto by the higher resolution electron microscopy. And that was cell biology. And in cell biology, there were all these words like endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus which were not yet defined in molecular terms. And Jim Watson decided, quite rightly, now was the time to start to write a textbook that would at least try to connect them. OK. Jim Watson gets people to do things by having a great vision and by convincing you could do it in very little time. <laughs> uh, he said it would only take us two months, one month in the summer of 1978 and one month in the summer of 1979. So that was off by something like a factor of six. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is a group of uh, first authors, first edition authors. There's Jim Watson, the hat on. And we were walking across Abbey Road uh, because that's near the place where we all worked together uh, on writing the, the textbook. And we still work there, actually. Uh, and we put this uh, imitation of a Beatles cover on the back of one of our early editions of our textbook. Uh, and it's become the most popular part of our textbook. So, now <laughs> so every time we have a new Beatles cover, the next, I'll give away a secret. The next one coming out in essential cell biology is Yellow Submarine. I'm not supposed to tell anybody that, but anyway. <laughs> So producing the first edition was very much harder than we had expected. None of us would ever start this if Jim Watson had been accurate and told us how long it was going to take. We all lived together at long book meetings for a total of over a year of 12-hour days. And everybody worked on everybody else's chapter. That's what made the book a quality effort. Uh, and each time we write a new edition, very importantly for young students, we're humbled by how much we still don't know. Now, the problem with textbooks is you always write what you know. And students get the idea that 90% of what we need to know is already known. And so they think, well, cell biology is all over. But that's completely wrong. We write about what we know, and we leave out the 90% that we don't know. And so in the last edition, we add this feature at the end of each chapter, more than, 100 of, more than 100 of these, what we don't know that's very important. And these are great challenges for young scientists. This is the most fun part of writing our textbook this time, because we all made lists and we voted on them and, and finally produced this, this list. But it, just a little bit of what we don't know. Uh, we're really quite ignorant of the many of the fundamental aspects of a, even the simplest living cell. And that's part of the theme of this lecture today. So when I started, I was working in the chemistry lab, Paul Doty at Harvard. And he was a physical chemist. And physical chemists know how fast molecules move at the micro scale. And so uh, they have you know hundreds of thousands of collisions a second. So we all thought life was just uh, the same as putting a lot of biological molecules in a very small space, very con concentrated. And they would not have to be organized at all. They would just collide and create a living cell. That's, of course, all wrong. The cell is much different than a tiny test tube. An early discovery was the importance of so-called protein machines. We now know that almost every process in the cell is driven by a complex of 10 or more proteins that form machines that function very much like the machines that we know from our everyday life. But they're not driven by electricity, of course. They undergo ordered movements, which are essential. The ordered movements are essential to create any 
machine. You have to have organized, ordered movements. And that means unidirectional allosteric protein changes. And these are driven by proteins in the set that harness the energy of bound ATP or GTP to drive conformations in one, only one direction. So let's see if we can get this movie to work. I don't know if we can get it. This is my favorite movie. This shows uh, how DNA replication actually works. And as DNA is being replicated at the same speed as in uh, your Using computer animation based on cells. molecular research, we are able to picture how DNA is replicated in living cells. Well, that's you are looking at an assembly line of miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA double helix and cranking out a copy of each strand. Well, actually, you're not moving, but anyway. <laughs> the DNA to be copied. Using computer animation based on molecular research, we are able to picture how DNA is replicated in living cells. You are looking at an assembly line of miniature <laughs> biochemical machines that are pulling That's apart right. the DNA double helix Just playing the sound. and That's cranking okay. out a copy of each strand. You'll get strand. the idea from the sound. <laughs> the DNA to be copied enters the... Whoops. Sorry. All right. I think I did something wrong. You want to just skip this, or do you want? Using computer animation based on molecular research, we are able to picture how DNA is replicated in living cells. So you are looking at an assembly line of miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA double helix and cranking out a copy of each strand. The DNA to be copied enters the production line from bottom left. The twirling blue molecular machine is called a helicase. It spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine as it unwinds the double helix into two strands. One strand is copied continuously and can be seen spooling off to the right. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules. Well, I'm sorry. We, I always have these problems. But anyway, technology is not all it's supposed to be. <laughs> but that video you could find on YouTube. If you just Google uh, DNA replication, molecular biology of the cell, or Garland publishing. Anyway, it's, it's a short video that we made for the textbook. So my major point is not to talk about DNA replication, which I worked on, but the fact is that the chemistry of life is driven by protein machines. Each one works differently, but they're each incredibly elegant and complicated. The chemistry of life is by far the most sophisticated chemistry we know. And that's, of course, why I could talk to you and why you could listen. Otherwise, we'd be some kind of slime down there, single cells. It's the incredibly complicated chemistry that we need to figure out uh, more details about. It's no, no, what's it replicated. Doing? OK. So I worked with uh, the T4 bacteriophage system, as it was said in the beginning. It was a model organism for DNA replication, because this large virus that affects the bacterium E. coli makes all its own replication proteins. And it does the same kind of replication as humans do, with only seven proteins. So I could actually figure out, my lab and others could figure out how this thing worked to make this movie using only seven proteins, using biochemistry and in vitro systems. Eukaryotic DNA replication is basically the same, but it uses many more proteins. And recently, uh, in, from John Diffley's lab in England, they've been able to reconstitute the whole yeast replication system this has 16 purified proteins made from 42 polypeptides, so it's incredibly more complicated. And this is a summary of how that works. And they've been able to figure out in a great breakthrough how that really happened. 
But it's only the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's perhaps a tenth of the proteins critical to DNA replication and DNA repair. And those proteins are very important for keeping us healthy. Uh, and we need to understand how they work. There's a lot more to do. Understanding the molecular details of these DNA replication and DNA repair pathways will be critical to improving human health. As one example, tumor progression selects for hypermutability and different tumors will by chance acquire a very different defect in one of the repair or replication pathways. And there's a great potential in exploiting each particular defect to eradicate cancer. This has to be done in what's called personalized medicine. What is wrong with your tumor? What made it hypermutable? And then treat it with that specific agent. And the start has been made with the so-called PARP inhibitors, poly-AP, poly-ADP ribose polymerase inhibitors, which is now used clinically for treating BRCA1 minus tumors uh, and has been quite effective. So it's an important challenge for the next generation of biologists is to attain the information needed to accurately describe the mechanism of every type of protein machine in the cell. And this will require the reconstitution of many hundreds of protein machines from their purified components so that the detailed chemistry of each machine can be deciphered through reactions studied in the test tube. You know, if you're trying to understand something like DNA replication by perturbing a whole cell, it's just too complicated. You can't figure out too many things happen. You need to purify the subcomponents. This has been done, for example, for protein synthesis of the ribosome, another machine that we really understand pretty well. But most protein machines in the cell, we know a lot of their components, but we don't know how they work. So I'm now going to skip to other things that we don't know. Two recent surprises uh, for textbook authors are, first of all, the recognition that extensive sets of scaffolds, special protein and RNA molecules, produce biochemical subcompartments in the cell without requiring any membrane and that many of these scaffolds can assemble to create larger phase-separated li liquid compartments. Uh, I'll talk about this first. This, the one I'll talk about next is the, the fact that uh, this, the positive and negative feedback loops that underlie nearly all chem cell chemistry create complex networks of interactions that give rise to emergent uh, properties that the human mind can't understand without new computational methods. So let me talk about the first one first. Scaffold proteins. This is a figure from our, simple figure from our textbook about how scaffold proteins work. Basically they, they concentrate with having specific binding sites. They concentrate a set of uh, reacting molecules that because they're close together in this flexible scaffold protein will collide much more rapidly than they did do a free in solution and form products much more rapidly. And moreover, because the scaffolds are located in particular parts of the cell, this reaction will happen in a particular part of a cell. Uh, this is the simplest case I know of a, a scaffold that's been well studied. It's from Tom Pollard's lab. It's, it has to do with this green molecule called formin, which facilitates rapid polymerization of actin filaments Actin filaments are the red things going down. They will go down through the floor far, very far. Long filaments going down into the sub-basement. Uh, and they're growing at one end thanks to this green molecule that is helping the actin filament grow. And the, the way it helps the actin filament grow in part is by having these loading zones, these whiskers, these scaffolds that are holding actin monomers close by so that they can collide very rapidly with the growing actin filament. Uh, this was discovered because uh, when Pollard did these experiments, he found that the actin filament was growing faster than the rate of diffusion controlled reactions, which diffusion control is a well known physical chemical property uh, of uh, a reaction that account, uh, occurs every time there's a collision of a, of, of a precursor molecule with the molecule it's going to react with. So actin filament is growing much faster than it could grow just freely from solution because it has this loading zone, the scaffold, keeping 
the incoming monomer is very concentrated. More complex scaffolds, famous ones are uh, involved in uh, protein kinase signaling. Uh, this is from Wendell Lim at UCSF. Uh, hubs for controlling the flow of cellular information. Uh, but there are even much more complicated scaffolds. And RNA molecules are now known to be used to produce scaffolds. These are thousands of non-coding RNAs, so-called link RNAs, which many of which have a scaffolding role. So scaffolds are involved in forming many different biochemical factories inside the cell. We call these phase-separated intracellular condensates, many different names for them. And this is an old micrograph that was made long before we understood what's going on. <laughs> but just, just a picture of a cell nucleus where the places where transcription RNA molecules are made by transcription are colored red, and the places where DNA replication is going on are colored green. Uh, and it was known for a long time that these so-called factories only form when they're needed, and then they go away. So once RNA synthesis stops, the RNA factories go away. Once DNA synthesis stops, the our, our DNA factories go away. If you take a, a microscope and make a, a UV damaged line through a nucleus, all the repair proteins concentrated in factories along that line. So, so we had no idea what was going on, but now I think it's generally agreed that even though we don't understand the de details, what's happening is aggregation of scaffold proteins are forming these intracellular condensates, uh, which, which only form when they're actually needed, and they only form where they're needed in the cell. Very prominent new field uh, uh, opening up areas of cell biology that we didn't understand before. So this is what life is really like. Uh, you know, we uh, think we understand something when we can draw a cartoon like this. You know, these are all the proteins that interact. Some of these are scaffolds. And, and, and in this cartoon, at the recepting, receptor side of a synapse, the scaffolds are drawn as these yellow whiskers. And in here, special biochemistry is made because of the, all the special proteins that are brought there by the scaffolds. And in fact, uh, this is the secret of life. <laughs> we couldn't memorize anything. We couldn't learn anything without uh, these kinds of special biochemical compartments. And so here's a figure from our latest, not, almost not yet published, uh, textbook. So basically, RNA scaffolds and protein scaffolds form aggregates together uh, that bind product molecules. And here's the nucleolus, uh, a membrane free. It's, it's not formed by a membrane, but it's long, long been known that all the materials for making ribosomes are here in a special part of the nucleus. Centrosome matrix, this orange area, nucleates microtubules, also similar kind of material. Here's the area underneath the synapse, uh, very special biochemistry. How many of these compartments there are that we don't yet know, but probably many hundreds. And this is what helps make life possible. In conclusion, a cell is nothing like a test tube. Nearly everything is organized inside the cell by protein and RNA scaffolds. Uh, and that's something that we've only come to realize in the last five years. So emergent properties. So this is uh, how nearly all biology works. When I was a student uh, a long time ago, we learned that A goes to B, goes to C, goes to D, goes to E. But actually, they, that's right, but it wouldn't be useful to the cell unless there were all these control feedback and feed forward circuits to control what metabolites are made at any one time. And there's no way to understand such pathways without mathematics. And uh, we need new mathematics. Uh, this is what we. This is one way of thinking about systems biology, one of the many challenges for systems biology. And here's one example: the actin filament network. Here's the actin filament, the same thing that was in red that that previous diagram. diagram a major component of the cytosol film forms these long filaments. But what the filaments do depend on all these other binding proteins. Uh, 
For example, the green ones are all myosin. This is just a, a yeast cell, so it's even more complicated than in our cells. Myosins hydrolyze the ATP and make motion. Uh, then there's molecules like the formins that affect filament dynamics, like these purple things. Anyway, so even when we know all the details of a network like this, we don't know what to do. The human brain can't deal with it. We need computational ways of figuring out what this actually does in the cell. It makes the actin do different things at different times as appropriate for the cell's life. And to understand this, we need new ways of analyzing all these networks. So as a consequence of the great complexity of life, even when we gain a complete knowledge of all the molecules, protein machines, and molecular interactions in the cell, we will not be able to understand even the simplest of living cells. Instead, life reflects the emergent properties that result from very complex networks of interactions. So my conclusion it will probably take most of the century to gain a true understanding of how cells and organisms work. We're going to need much more biochemistry and purified systems that reconstitute biological reactions. Also needed are new quantitative methods for analyzing and understanding the enormous complexity of life chemistry. We don't yet have the technology we need, and it's going to take some very clever people. These people are going to have to know computation and math, but they're also going to have a, have to have a deep understanding of biology. Otherwise, they don't know what to measure and what to model. Okay. So keeping science healthy. How do we produce a scientific enterprise that's maximally productive, that helps to improve human livelihoods by making important discoveries that will improve our health, our environment, our agriculture? So to keep science healthy, we must work to stimulate innovation. So what is innovation? <laughs> uh, if we're going to stimulate uh, innovation, we need to recognize how new knowledge arises. And the U.S. National Academy of Sciences uh, in the late 1990s when I was there, we were challenged by President Clinton who, who gave science uh, to the Vice President's uh, office, Vice President Gore. And right away, 1993, he floated a rumor saying that if you want to get a research grant, we want you to explain to us when you're a scientist, what is that research grant, if you're successful, going to do for human beings? So, so, so basically, Gore's idea was that in order to get money to do research from the federal government, U.S. federal government, you had to be able to say what my research will be doing to help human beings. So all of us who understood science at the Academy thought this was a terrible idea because we knew that basic science would not be funded, because we can never predict what basic knowledge, the kind of questions that I was just asking, what's going to come out of the fact that we now understand that there are all these protein and RNA scaffolds? We don't know, but we know that something's going to happen good, because the more understanding, the more we can manipulate uh, biology. So what we did to defend against the vice president <laughs> We produced 20 eight-page pamphlets with specific examples of how fundamental science has led to very important things from human health, human uh, technology in the past. We, we said we can't look forward, but we could look backward. And the first one we did, this whole series is now still up on the web. It's called Beyond Discovery, The Path from Research to Human Benefit. There's a website. If you just Google Beyond Discovery Academy, you'll find the the 20 PDF pamphlets, and each one has a centerfold with a timeline of how that human benefit came about. And the central point was we could never predict how the basic knowledge would have been useful. And this one for the global positioning system, GPS, the first one we did, started with the invention of atomic clocks by physicists. Atomic clocks allowed human beings to keep time to a billionth of a second. Everybody thought this was wonderful. It won a Nobel Prize. But everybody also thought this was useless. Why would anybody ever want to keep time to a billionth of a second? So what this timeline shows, and this is, it continues out to the present, uh, is that by combining that atomic clock 
with many different other unpredictable discoveries. By the early 1990s, we had a series of 24 satellites uh, telling us exactly where we were on the Earth by how many billions of a second it took for that signal to get to us. <laughs> and, and that uh, basically, each of the satellites contains an atomic clock, made possible by the atomic clock. So we did this over and over again. We did it for the AIDS protease. We did it for the cure for childhood leukemia. Uh, 20 different examples. And we put them all in the offices of politicians. <laughs> And we also, for, especially for politicians, we made a one-page summary of the eight-page pamphlet. <laughs> the major thing I like to say, well, first of all, we prevented that uh, idea from ever happening. They never did demand that we tell them in every research grant what it was going to do for humanity. But very importantly, many of us who worked on these, I worked on some of these, but all my colleagues in the academy contributed uh, we learned a lot more than we knew before about how science works, how science leads to human benefit. It was really an educational opportunity for us. And the fundamental reason for the explosive growth of science, why is science moving more and more rapidly, is really this. The more knowledge you have, the more different ways it could be combined. And, of course, all the creation of GPS and everything else was just combining bits of old knowledge and new ways to create new, new knowledge. And the more knowledge you have, the more uh, new kind of knowledge you, you could make because 100 units of knowledge can be combined in 100 times more ways than can 10 units of knowledge. So it's exponential, an exponential uh, growth of, of scientific capability. And this is sort of a diagram I made of, so my field when I was working it, you know, every scientist makes use here I am, makes use of other people's work. We made use of the work on T4 bacteriophage by these people. We made use of discovery of DNA polymerase by Arthur Kornberg. We made use of radioisotopes in biology and so on. So we chose what things we would combine to make a new result. And today, the same kind of field is moving faster and faster. There are more things to combine. And that's why uh, the lab in England was able to make DNA replication work in vitro with 46 different polypeptides. But there's a catch. As knowledge grows, it becomes increasingly difficult to find the right combinations. And here's a wonderful quote from the, the uh, French mathematician, Henri Poiré. He was also something of a philosopher. He did a lot of thinking and writing about science. He said, the source of creativity in science, to create consists precisely in not making useless combinations and making those which are useful but, and which are only a small minority. Invention is discernment choice. Among chosen combinations, the most fertile will often be those formed of elements drawn from domains which are far apart. So this is why I tell our graduate students, if you're going to go to only two seminars a week at UCSF, go to the two seminars on something you don't know anything about. Don't go to the the normal thing is they go to the seminars where they already know 95% of the material. That's not helping. You've got to be, be creative. You've got to combine new ways of thinking. And uh, so he said the true work of the inventor consists in choosing among these combinations so as to eliminate the useless ones, and the vast majority are useless. I always tell, tell students there are billions of experiments you could do. You shouldn't do nearly any of them. You have to think about very carefully, what are you going to do? Uh, the other analogy I use is um, painting a picture. So I talk about Rembrandt being able to take, his, you know, pigments and in in his uh, painting uh, materials and make a beautiful picture. So if you gave me the same materials that Rembrandt had, I couldn't make anything useful. It's, it's, it, creativity is using all the choice. Uh, and scientists, good scientists learn in their training how to create in the same way that Rembrandt did. It's all about thinking, what combinations can I put together to do something that's important? And, and, and that's what innovation is, and that's what makes a really good scientist, doing something important in a different way than other people are doing it. So science is very much like art, in my opinion. 
So here's a great place to get uh, new ideas for your research. Uh, this is a website created by my colleague in the next office at UCSF, Ron Vail, called iBiology. It now has almost 500 talks by really outstanding scientists on it. So it, when the graduate students late at night, you're tired, you can just watch somebody talk about how they did their science and think about how can I use that kind of thinking for my own work. And uh, in order to give these talks, you stand in front of a blue screen so your slides are, you're, you're talking in, in your slides when you actually show it. Uh, here's Randy. Uh, Checkman talking about his Nobel Prize working work for high school students. Uh, and I have a little short talk there called The Importance of Failure, which uh, I'm very good at failing. <laughs> we all fail, and the message is we all learn from our failures. Those people who are successful have failed many times, but we study our failures well, and we don't make the same mistake twice. So a major problem we see in science today is the channeling of research topics due to training and inertia, if, when you write a textbook, you realize that there are many important questions, like some of the ones that we have in how, what we don't know at the back of our test, many important problems that nobody's working on with modern methods. Uh, but there are many other spaces, you know, all know about them, overcrowded experimental uh, spaces where many labs are doing the same thing, and everybody's racing everybody else, it's no fun. So the real challenge in being a scientist is how to jump from the red spaces to the white spaces. How can I do something that's going to be important by doing something that's unexplored with the kind of methodologies that I have, the kind of skills that I have? And uh, unfortunately, our present system for funding research in the United States, at least, I don't know anything about India, strongly deter discourages risk-taking preventing leaps into the white spaces where great new discoveries can be made. Uh, and the second problem, uh, uh, in the US, the National Institutes of Health, NIH, has been greatly overemphasizing applied research, translational biomedical research. But with so many unknowns and so little understanding, basic research on biological mechanisms remains absolutely crucial for improving humans' health. Of course, the politicians don't know this. We need to educate the politicians. Uh, here's my favorite editorial. I was editor of science for five years, and I had to pick an editorial or write one every week. And of the 250 editorials, this is my favorite one. It was written by Huda Zogby. Uh, she's an MD, never got a PhD. She was treating patients with Rett syndrome, with children, the brain defect, and she couldn't do anything for him, so she decided to become a researcher. And she now is a very famous researcher working on translational research, applied research, trying to solve human health problems. And she's from Lebanon, so she started out speaking Arabic. Arabic, and so she she says the challenge in translational medicine, what she's trying to do, is that scientists are trying to translate a text with the sophistication and depth of Shakespeare using a first grader's vocabulary and experience. She wants more basic research to help her do her own applied research. And she says, uh, today, many high qualified basic scientists feel compelled to jump on the translational medicine bandwagon. And she wants much more basic research. So I'm just going to give you some examples. Here's one example of how little we don't know. Uh, a very nice paper in Science, uh, taking uh, about about a year and a half ago, uh, taking uh, uh, microcockle uh, mycoplasma, the, the, sort of the very tiny primitive bacteria, with, a, with it had something like 600 genes, one of the smallest, simplest bacteria we know. And uh, trying to remove genes, and they used very elaborate, clever techniques to take away as many genes as they could before the thing would, the bacteria wouldn't grow with a doubling time of at least three hours. And they were left with 479 genes. There's a minimal genome uh, of this bacteria, and the amazing thing is 149 of the 473 genes 
are of unknown function. Isn't that amazing? So I would bet there are many Nobel Prizes hiding and figuring out what those things do. Because <laughs> there are kinds of functions we probably don't even know about. But almost nobody's working on them. Another example is the importance of Drosophila, the fruit fly. We're still far from understanding how cells work together to form and maintain tissues. Many examples show that first working out a mechanism in Drosophila provides a shortcut to understanding humans. Almost everything we know about human developmental biology came out of Drosophila. Thus, in our textbook sixth edition, the chapter on the development of tissues contains 50 re references to Drosophila, four times more than the next most cited organism. So, and yet, some of our politicians would argue that working on fruit flies should not be funded by the federal government because it's not directly solving a disease. Consider the human brain, which is the ultimate uh, emergent property. It has an ultimate emergent property of human consciousness. This is really a hard problem. How do we get human consciousness out of, out of this network of brain cells? So this is a page from our textbook it's showing how complicated it is. Human brain contains more than 100 billion neurons, each of which on average has to make connections with 1,000 others according to a regular and predictable wiring plan. So I, 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 I really admire people who have the, courage to, have the courage to try to figure out how the human brain works. It's an incredibly hard problem. I would argue they're badly going to need other people to figure out how the Drosophila brain works before we could help to understand the human brain. Drosophila brain is a million times smaller, a million times less neurons than the human brain. That's about 100,000 neurons. Each neuron could be mapped. Uh, you have powerful genetics to knock out all kinds of functions. The basic understanding of the brain needs to come out of model organisms like this to help people better understand the human brain. It's a shortcut to our understanding of the human brain. To understand cells, we also need new models. This is an amazing organism, Stentor. It's a single-celled large ciliate. T.H. Morgan, the famous T.H. Morgan who worked on Drosophila in the early 1900s had, was working on Stentor. It was such an amazing biological organism. In later years, a man by the name of Vance Tartar spent his whole life cutting up the ciliate, single cell ciliate and repasting it in different ways. And he discovered that it has a, like a global positioning system on its surface. It knows where its mouth is supposed to be. There's a ridge over there. That, and it has all these structures. So every part of the cell knows where it should, what it should do at that part of the cell. So a single cell has a coordinate system on its surface and knows how to put things in the right place. So we have no understanding how this is possible. And uh, I would bet that human cells have some of the same abilities, but we don't even see them. So we need to work it out in other organisms. And uh, I'm showing this slide because a young colleague of mine, Wallace Marshall, a young scientist at UCSF, had the courage to start working on this organism. Nobody was working on it, basically, for years. Now there's all these modern technologies that we have, much more sophisticated microscopy, RNAi to knock out genes, genome sequences. So he's taking on the challenge of trying to figure out how this amazing cell creates this a pattern. What are the molecular mechanisms uh, involved? And very few scientists are willing to try, try to take those leaps into the wild, uh, white spaces uh, because they're afraid they won't get uh, funded by the federal government. They're afraid that Obviously, if you're trying something new and hard, it's, it's going to be a while before you publish any papers. So you can't expect uh, a lot, large publication record from people who work in new fields. This is, so what I hear repeatedly from even the most outstanding young scientists on the US job market these days is very sad. Everybody tells me I won't be able to get a research grant unless I work on mouse or human protein cells, tissues after my postdoc. I think this is so, such a tragic situation. It's preventing us from really breaking through in what we need to know in biology. There have also been very disturbing changes in the age distribution of independent 
researchers in the past 30 years in the United States. I don't know what the situation is in India, but here's the data for the United States. So when I start, so 1980, I actually started in 1965. So back, this is, but in my day, most of us started at age 28 with our own research laboratory. In 1980, there were a few of those people. Most of them were starting by, you know, age 30, 33 or 35. Today, there's basically nobody under the age of 35 doing, uh, having their own lab. And look at all these old people, people my age. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a traitor to my age. <laughs> so in the United States, they had did this horrible thing. They said, nobody has to retire anymore. Uh, <clears throat> so all these people learning how to work the system, still running labs, Obviously, they're getting the grant. They're using young people to do the research because they're, they're too old to work. <laughs> but anyway, the money should be going to young ideas and young people. So my friends and I started a movement called Rescuing U.S. Biomedical Research. Uh, and it was me, Mark Kirshner from Department of Systems Biology. He's the chair at Harvard. Shirley Tillman was the president of Princeton University at the time. Harold Varma is the former director of the National Institutes of Health, uh, Nobel Prize winner. So we've been working to try to help young people uh, do the best science that, that they can. Uh, the president of Johns Hopkins, after our article, published an analysis in the same journal, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which showed the proportion of all grant funding awarded to scientists under the age of 36 in the United States has dropped from 5.6% in 1980 to 1.3% 1 in 2012. This is terrible. So here's a great question. You know, I'm living in the middle of Silicon Valley. How successful would Silicon Valley be if nearly 99% of all investments went to innovators who were 36 years or, old or older? It would be completely useless. <laughs> So what might be done to correct this uh, problem? We discovered that Europe, it, Europe used to be the worst place for young scientists. They had these big labs, and you wor worked for, uh, you know, as an assistant professor for an old scientist until you were an old scientist. But they, some very visionary people in 2007, after many years of struggle, formed the European Research Council which holds an annual pan-European competition for young investigators who are making the transition from working under a supervisor to being independent researchers. These starting grants are reserved for investigators with two to seven years of experience since completion of their PhD. The critical thing is that uh, reviewing criteria, criteria specifically focused on novelty, interdisciplinary, and high-risk, high-gain research, and each successful applicant is funded for five years with a very sizable grant. Uh, so another very important uh, fact is that these young scientists compete only with themselves. Three separate competitions are held in which investigators compete only with others at the same stage of their careers. Starting, consolidated, this is sort of the second grant, and then advanced, no limits. And the, but all these require innovation and novelty. And the majority of the money goes to scientists who are within 12 years of their PhD. A lot, a lot of money. And it's not only biology, it's physics, social science, engineering as well. And here's the age distribution of ERC grantees. You see, so different from the United States. An average uh, starting consolidated grant holder is 35 years old. So, so they're getting most of their money from the ERC into the young people, and they're letting them start careers with new projects, innovative projects, risky projects. So the other thing is that they use a broad group of senior scientists to review these grants. So, so, so for all of life sciences, these are the only review groups they have. And so molecular and structural biology and biochemistry will have plant scientists, uh, chemists, uh, 
uh, animal sciences, bacterial sciences. Nobody's arguing for their own field. Too often in the United States, the review groups are very narrow, trying to support the same kind of science that they're doing. And so they're resisting, in many ways, innovation. So the proposal for the United States, we're about to publish a paper uh, outlining the details, is to have a new program at the NIH focusing on funding the best young investigators within seven years of their PhD, committing enough funds to this new program to replace the 2,000 independent investigators aged 36 or younger who have been lost since the early 1980s. This, this, is, this is amazing. Uh, we have almost no young investigators now. Encourage ambitious aims and do not require preliminary results. And review these applications using broad groups of outstanding investigators. This is a recent talk on the iBiology uh, website. He, Tony Hyman's the only non-American. He's the director of the Max Planck Institute in Dresden. He did his postdoc at UCSF. Uh, and he's made this wonderful short iBiology talk proposing uh, basically what we're going to publish in our article soon. Uh, sort of a revolutionary redistribution of money from older people towards younger people. And then I just want to uh, talk about one other very critical issue. I can't avoid doing that when I'm in India. In 1993, I made my first trip to India. It was to New Delhi, to the first ever meeting of the World Academies of Science. Uh, and at that meeting, uh, we were focused on trying to get science into the world population meeting that was going to happen the next year, 1994, in Cairo. And it was a very successful meeting where we Without the scientific community doing that, there would have been no science in the population meeting, where, of course, there's a science of population uh, issues. And uh, at that meeting, I learned of this scientific temper <laughs> idea that, uh, that Nehru had uh, coined in the late 1940s. He started writing about this. Uh, so we need to spread Nehru's scientific temper throughout society every society, not just India, by redefining what is meant by science education. This is what I've been working on for the last 10 years. So this is the image we want for science. This is the Einstein statue in front of my office in Washington for 12 years. Einstein is very crumply and has a big, friendly lap. And these classes of students who come to visit Washington from their high school uh, they come and take their class picture almost always on Einstein's lap. So the image we want for science is to be very friendly <laughs> and approachable, <laughs> something that everybody <laughs> But this is the facts. This is a true story uh, told to me by a mother. <laughs> Her eight-year-old U.S. student came home from school and told his mother, now I get it, science is just like spelling. You just need to memorize it, and it doesn't make any sense. Does that apply to science in India, too? <laughs> we make these kids memorize all these words, like endoplasmic reticulum, <laughs> uh, followed by a sentence that says what the endoplasmic reticulum does. And then they have to spit it back on some exam. And it means absolutely nothing to them. Uh, my grandchildren hate cell biology. <laughs> They had to memorize all these words, parts of a cell, but they don't know what a cell is or how. They have no appreciation that the mere uh, existence of a self-replicating system, the cell, is really the most amazing thing in the universe. And that's completely missing. Because all they studied is that there is a cell, and here are all the parts, and you've got to memorize all these names. It's a tragedy. It's not science, and it's turning everybody off from science. And it helps to create politicians who hate science. You know, what would happen if President Trump had actually had a good science education? <laughs> would he believe in climate change? <laughs> so there's an, you know, scientists are always optimistic. Because <laughs> we've seen how science advances. You know, very hard problems get solved by picking off a piece of it at a time. You don't try to solve everything at once. And there's a special opportunity now in the United States, which of course is very relevant to all countries, 
the new standards of reading and math and science, they all require major synergistic changes in K-12 education where students need to use the information to sort, analyze, and critique it to make and defend arguments to solve problems and incubate ideas. Classrooms are supposed to be noisy places where students are talking to each other, trying to answer questions that are meaningful to them. Meaningful to them. So uh, this is what science should look like in school. This is a picture taken years ago in San Francisco of 12-year-old students trying to solve, working in groups of four, four students working together, trying to solve a, a problem. And the teacher is like a coach walking around the back of the classroom. And it's very, the classroom is very noisy because the students are working together, learning by doing active science learning. This is what five-year-olds did in San Francisco uh, when I left. Uh, it, it all went away after I left, not because of me, but because of uh, a national policy called No Child Left Behind. But, but uh, in 1993, this is part of the, what five-year-olds did at the first year of school. Uh, it's called kindergarten. At the right time of the year, when there's seeds on the ground, they put on clean white socks, they're given clean white socks, and they walked around in the schoolyard under the trees or in, in a park. Then they came back to class and their socks had dirt specks on them. And with a four, they're given a forceps and a, and a white sheet of paper with numbered squares. With the forceps, they took off each black speck and put it in a different numbered square. And then on a, they had another piece of paper with the same numbered squares, and they had a little plastic $3 microscope where they looked at each speck and they drew what it looked like on the other piece of paper. And then the challenge was the, for the five-year students, which do you think are seeds and which do you think are dirt? Now, most of the specks will be dirt. <laughs> a few of them will be seeds because seeds evolve to stick to animal fur and they stick to socks. And the teacher has to be trained, so the teacher never gives the right answer. The kids have to suggest the answer. And the, so the teacher waits until some kid suggests that I think the round ones are seeds. You know, the regular shaped ones are seeds. And again, the teacher doesn't say that's the right answer. The teacher then says to the rest of the class, what do you think of this idea? And they all discuss it. And eventually, the class realizes, the, you know, all the class agrees that it's a possibility that all the round ones are seeds and the other ones are dirt. And then the next day, the teacher might say, well, we now have this idea that which are seeds or which are dirt. How can we test it? Uh, we don't, you know, and so eventually some five-year-old kid will say, we, this is, kid's going to be a scientist, obviously. <laughs> ah, he gets a brilliant idea. We can put all the regular shaped ones in one pot and plot them and put the other ones in a different pot and see if we only grow plants from the pot that has regular shaped objects. And again, the teacher does not say that's right. <laughs> the teacher says, what did the class think about this? And then the, kids, the, the class agrees that this is a possibility, and then they do the experiment. So this shows you could do real science with even five-year-old kids. And so we know how to do this. We just need to do this. Of course, the problems get harder as the kids get older. So, when I went to the academy, I took the job in 1993. I didn't want the job uh, because I had to close my lab. But they told me I could use the academy pr to promote science education in the United States, and we tried to do that. Uh, but many of my members, you know, famous scientists, said, this is ridiculous. Uh, lower level education is not our problem. It's everybody else's problem. We only teach college. But one of the things I learned by being at the academy for 12 years, is actually the major barrier to progress at earlier levels is to change science education at the college level. Because when you think about it, the way we teach biology one defines what science education means to everybody, the parents, the future adults, the teachers, future teachers. So if we say biology one, you must memorize all the facts about a cell. Uh, then that becomes, for the lower levels, the template. That's why the people who write textbooks for 12-year-olds 12 12 have them memorize all the cell parts and write a sentence. And the, the, the books that we have, textbooks we have for students age 12 in the United States are the hardest textbooks I've ever seen. 
because there's no way to understand them. It's one word, one bold-faced word, followed by a sentence, and they don't have any idea what this sentence means. You know, And the plasmic, uh, we take them, and the sentence would be, uh, sorts and processes molecules. Well, what does that mean? They, don't, they, don't, they have no idea what this means. They just memorize it. They spit it back on an exam. Uh, anyway, so important barrier to progress is a traditional lecture format that allows a sig signal, signal professor to be in a room like this and just talk, like I'm doing today. Uh, so we call it lecturing. Can we create much better alternatives without a great increase in cost? And uh, in the United States, uh, catalyzed by government grants from the National Science Foundation, last 20 years, many experiments have been going on in college scientists. So we now know a lot. A lot of research has been done. This is one of my favorite examples of what college biology uh, can look like. This is the University of Minnesota. This woman with a star on her back is Robin Wright, the Dean of Biological Sciences. She was teaching Biology One in a room uh, that seats uh, two, about 200 people, flat room. Uh, kids sit around a desk with two uh, laptops connected to the internet. Uh, this is what we call a flip classroom. Before the class, the students read our textbook or watch videos. They come in for five minutes, have a brief quiz so that the teacher knows they did the work. And then they sit around the table for an hour and a half solving problems. Uh, and, and this kind of teaching has been studied through control research, scientific research on education. And it shows that students come away with a much better understanding of science and a much different view of science than they would get by just memorizing stuff. Uh, this is active learning in the same college biology class, what the classroom looks like. Just like the classroom for 12-year-olds, very noisy classroom, kids solving problems, but they're using the web, learning how to use the web to find reliable information. Uh, our academy has published uh, many really excellent studies on the research that has been done and uh, has produced this, uh, among other things, this very special book called Reaching Students, what research says about effective instruction in undergraduate science and engineering, specifically designed for college faculty. It talks about, you know, why change? How do, why change? Why, why, and what you could do in a lecture room just like this, just to try to do something active, even in a large lecture hall. And all the academy publications are available as free PDFs, including this one. So if you go to this website and search for reaching students, or search for reaching students academies on academies on uh, Google, you'll find the, this this booklet. So uh, we're trying, and we're getting actually significant change, even from college professors, who may be the hardest people to change. <laughs> this is a picture of me. Uh, the academy uh, and now other organizations run summer workshops for college science teachers. And I, I was at one of the first workshops at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and here I am with a bunch of Biology One teachers learning how to use this TV remote, which is a clicker, which is how you get responses from a class. You, in a classroom like this, you ask, a, every 15 minutes, you ask a conceptual question that half the students are going to get wrong. It's, it's, something that requires real understanding of the material you're teaching. Then the students vote with the clicker. The results are shown on the screen. But they could also vote by raising their hands. They don't need this fancy stuff. Then the important part is then the students turn around to their neighbors and talk for three minutes about the question. And then they vote again. And the research shows that it goes from 50% of the students getting the right answer to 85%. On average, the student's getting the right answer. It also shows it doesn't make any difference whether your neighbor knows the right answer or not. It's the discussion with your neighbor that makes you think more carefully. And that's a general principle, I think, behind active science learning in all levels. It's the reason that research shows that, you, you know, the idea that uh, very, uh, it was a crazy idea in a way, 
One laptop per child. You probably all heard about that. Big money raised in the United States to give laptops to kids all over the world. It was the wrong idea. You, you don't want a kid on a laptop by himself to be working with two or three other students. We know from research that's the way students learn. So like this hole in the wall experiment in India, I'm sure the reason that worked is the kids are working together. They're not just one kid at the hole in the wall. So we know a lot from research on education that people are not using. And the academy has been trying to write that up in a way that everybody could use it. This is just one example. OK, and finally, there's the great importance of scientific values. I can't end. Uh, a talk in India where scientific temper was invented without talking about what scientific temper is. This is a wonderful book written by the physicist uh, Jacob Bernofsky, still in print, Science and Human Values. In 1945, Bernofsky was a young man in the British Army, and they had him fly over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where the atomic bombs had just been dropped. And he saw the massive destruction that had been caused by something that came out of science. And this, he became very depressed. And he spent 10 years reading scientific history, writing, and thinking. And he wrote this book, which concluded, of course, that on balance, science was very good for the world. And this is sort of the conclusion. He said, the society of scientists is simple because it has a directing purpose to explore the truth. Nevertheless, it has to solve the problem of every society, which is to find a compromise between the individual and the group. It must encourage the single scientist to be independent and the body of scientists to be tolerant. From these basic conditions, which form the prime values, there follows step by step a range of values, dissent, freedom of thought and speech, justice, honor, human dignity, and self-respect. Science has humanized our values. Men have asked for freedom, justice, and respect precisely as the scientific spirit has spread among them. That's a great sort of background summary about what Nehru meant by scientific temper and why he thought it was so important for India, a democracy with so many religions and languages, to have a scientific temper behind its new democracy. Ah, so I don't have the slide I want. Oh, I just want to show this one slide. I never. This is this is this is a slide of the same Robin Wright, uh, who uh, was in the star on her back. <laughs> I was just at a conference in Israel on science education, and this was her last slide, and uh, it makes the point that transforming education is a critical task everywhere. And she's pointing to a book which I haven't yet read, but it's about engineering education. But she emphasizes. You know, where, where is the joy in education? You know, education should be about the joy of learning. There is no joy in memorizing endoplasmic reticulum. <laughs> I mean, you can't expect any kid to have any enjoyment. So why do we make them suffer? It's this terrible. You know, five pillars of educational transformation, uh, joy, trust, courage, openness, connectedness, collaboration, community. This is really the in the broadest sense, the, the, the philosophy behind this modern movement to redefine what we mean by science education. If there's no joy in the science education, then we're missing a great opportunity. If kids have no recognition that the cell is the most amazing thing in the universe, they only think it's a box full of named parts that they have to memorize, we've killed all the joy probably forever. They probably will never want to know <laughs> anything more about cells. <laughs> and we do the same thing about DNA. You know, we have DNA taught to kids who have no idea that there's any problem to be solved by DNA. But when DNA was discovered, you know, I was there. I was 1952. We had no idea how heredity works. You know, just a complete mystery. Nobody could imagine how it would ever be possible to put so much information in such a small space and have it last for thousands of years. Uh, the, physicist, the great physicist Schrodinger wrote a, wrote a book called What is Life in 1944, 
this was his major conundrum. You know, you know anything small is going to be unstable, and how are we going to, you know? So at, at any rate, all of a sudden comes Watson and Crick, and this miracle of you know it was really joy <laughs> because we knew that, that there was something that was mysterious that was suddenly solved. This is what we want students to experience, and we can have them experience, but not if we don't change the nature of science education. So thank you very much. <laughs>
and your distinguished lecture. So we are all excited to seeing you here. The way when I shared this news, uh, most of them questioned back, what, Bruce Alberts is coming to our campus? <laughs> and with a smile and joy. <laughs> so that tells how much we are, and faculty, students are inspired by having you here in this campus and then your lecture today. So we thoroughly enjoyed your sense of knowledge, guidance in pursuing science and research that shared with us today. And of course, apart from the continuous learning from your great evolving textbook. Thank you. And uh, we, we all consider it as a Bible. Okay. Please accept our sincere. <laughs> and we wish to have many more editions and then diversify and then specialize the same thing in order to cater the complex behind the biology. Okay. Please accept our sincere thanks and take this opportunity to urge you to visit again in future. Uh, of course, big thanks to your wife. Uh, she is uh, soon joining uh, here, Betty. And to have uh, her and uh, she may be interacting with students in the afternoon. And uh, as you said, she loves to interact with uh, students. And then she will suggest us uh, you know, the career plan or et cetera. Thank you. Uh, all this happened because few important people behind this. First, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Aparao, who readily accepted to have you in, as a distinguished speaker series without wasting your time and constantly following up the program and facilitating it. Thank you, sir, uh, since he's not here. The next, Professor P. Redena, Dean, School of Life Sciences, for arranging this talk in School of Life Sciences and then facilitating it. There are two more important people, Professor Govardhan Mehta, uh, we believe is a friend of you and Professor D. Balasubramaniam, because of their invitation, along with our Vice Chancellor, the visit of yours has been possible. And especially Balu, who constantly following all the arrangements <laughs> of your visit and minute to minute update you wanted, <laughs> so that everything goes well. Thank you, sir. Thank you for both of them. All this could have not been possible uh, on so nice without the support of our uh, all the faculty and especially Professor Naresh and Madhu Babu, who made uh, several arrangements for this occasion. And I acknowledge the help of uh, staff from Vice Chancellor's office, Dean's office, and PRO's office, especially Mr. Aussies, Krishnaram, Mrs. Vijaya, and then Bhargavi for their uh, uh, support. I also extend many thanks to the team of audiovisual supporting staff, especially Murthy and others, and the media and uh, 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 the guests who visited. At last, but not least, I thank all the students, faculty, staff, and guests who graced this occasion and made this event as a memorable one. So once again, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.